Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to begin looking at fiscal policy as part of our discussion of stabilization policies in the macro economy. And uh, the information is in chapter 29 of your book on the pages that are listed there. And uh, our goal here is to un kind of understand the rationale for why government pursues stabilization policies. What are stabilization policies? We'll look at the difference between expansionary and contractionary policies. Um, it will discuss how to use expansionary and contractionary fiscal policy to address either a recessionary or inflationary gap. And we'll talk about the, the multiplier for government spending as well as look at the difference between government spending's multiplier and the tax multiplier. Let's first start by looking at why government decides to take action in the first place. Why does the government engage in fiscal policy to stabilize the economy? Because that's really what stabilization policy is, is addressing output gaps, either um, inflationary or recessionary in nature. And the reason why is because governments know that the, gov the economy will correct itself, but it can take years and years and years for that self-correction to occur, during which time it can be extraordinarily painful for people in the economy to go through this, this um, process of recalibrating prices and asset values. And so the government says, look, we want to keep prices in check, we want to keep employment strong, and we don't want to go through the painful process of recalibrating ourselves, and so let's step in and deal with the problem. When it comes to fiscal policy, the government is talking about uh, its tax and spend policies. And when we talk about taxing and spending policies, there's three general types, and we're going to get into each one in a little bit more detail. The government can either spend money on goods and services, it can increase what or decrease what are known as transfer payments, and then there are implications to the tax policy the government decides to pursue. When we're talking about spending on goods, we're talking about affecting aggregate demand because G is one of the components. So government spending is one of the components that influences overall aggregate demand in the economy. So if the government's going to increase its government spending, then that should shift aggregate demand to the right, creating a new equilibrium point at which we have higher output and higher prices. And when we say G, we're talking about things like uh, police cars and helicopters and schools and bridges and that kind of stuff, things that the government spends money on. And if they choose to decrease government spending, then what we would see is a left shift in aggregate demand and a reduction in price and output. When it comes to tax policy, what we're talking about is all sorts of different types of taxes. We have income taxes, which most people are familiar with, payroll taxes, excise taxes, all sorts of taxes. But every tax is the same in that it takes money from the taxpayer and transfers it to the government, which means it's reducing disposable income if they're increasing taxes, and it increases disposable income if they're cutting taxes. In this instance, if we're going to increase taxes, what that does is dis it diminishes the disposable income of individuals, which means they can't spend as much. Consumption would decrease, and we'd see a shift in the aggregate demand curve to the left. And the opposite would be true if we were to cut taxes. We would see an increase in disposable income and a shift to the right in aggregate demand. When it comes to transfer payments, what we're talking about essentially are welfare programs, taking tax money from one individual, uh, typically a higher tax earner, um, and then transferring that money in the form of cash typically to someone who earns less. And we're talking about things like Social Security, which is uh, transferred to the elderly from the young, uh, Medicare, which is a transfer from, uh, for health care purposes from the young to the old, and Medicaid, which is a transfer from high income earners for medical help and, and insurance to low income earners. And again, with transfer payments, what happens is that it affects people's disposable income, just like with taxes. If we see an increase in transfer payments from the government, then we would see an increase in the, uh, the disposable income for those who received the transfer, which should shift aggregate demand to the right. And if we saw a decrease in transfers, we would see the opposite effect, a reduction in disposable income from where it was before and a left shift in aggregate demand. And one thing to keep in mind with fiscal policy is that it can only affect the aggregate demand curve. And so fiscal policy is only appropriate when we see demand shocks to the overall macro economy. If there's a positive demand shock, we know that that creates an inflationary gap. Assuming we're at long run equilibrium, if there is a positive shock, it would move aggregate demand to the right, creating this inflationary gap of higher output and higher prices. And if we were at equilibrium to begin and we had a negative demand shock, we would go into a recessionary gap with a reduction in output and a reduction in prices. 
then the question becomes, once we know what recession or inflationary gap we're facing, how do we manipulate government tax and spending policy to address that output gap? So in this case, with an inflationary gap, we see a, sh a right shift in aggregate demand, which creates it. In order to solve that problem, um, in order to address it, we would shift aggregate demand uh, to the left. By doing so, we would prevent prices from continuing to rise. Because left alone, as we remember, the economy would go to a, to a long-run equilibrium again with at potential output, but at higher prices. So if the government wants to stop inflation during an inflationary gap, they have to pursue policies that will help diminish or dampen aggregate demand. So how do we do that? Well, again, inflationary gaps caused by a right shift in aggregate demand. So we need to figure out a way to get aggregate demand to come back to the left. In the situation of the inflationary gap, we have high, um, high levels of employment and prices are rising. So the government wants to address that. They're going to do that through what's known as contractionary fiscal policy. They want to shrink or contract aggregate demand in order to, to fight the rise in prices. And to do that, they're going to want to shift aggregate demand to the left. In order to get that aggregate demand curve to shift to the left, um, the government could do one of three things. They could either cut spending, which would shift aggregate demand to the left. They could cut transfer payments, which again would shift it to the left. Or they could raise taxes. Any one of those three will cause the, uh, the economy to shift out of the inflationary gap by pushing aggregate demand back to the left and back to long-run equilibrium. The government could also be facing a recessionary gap, which is caused by a left shift in aggregate demand, in which case what the government would want to do is pursue policies that would cause aggregate demand to shift back to the right in order to close up that recessionary gap and get increased levels of employment. So again, the aggregate demand curve shifts to the left, which is what's causing the recessionary gap, causing unemployment to rise and prices to drop. So the government wants to address that, and they're going to address that through what's called expansionary fiscal policy. They want the economy to expand or get bigger. And they're going to do that by shifting aggregate demand to the right. So either spending more or increasing transfers so that individuals can spend more, or they can cut taxes. Any one of those three or a combination of the three would serve as an expansionary fiscal policy and grow aggregate demand to the right. The limitation of fiscal policy, like I said, is that it only works on demand side issues. Supply shocks create a massive fiscal policy conundrum and something that fiscal policy cannot fully fix. And we've talked about this earlier when we talked about stagflation. Supply shocks, especially negative supply shocks to the left, creates this idea of stagflation, a shrinking economy with high prices. And as a result, there's not much that government can do to fix it. Fiscal policy, because it's aimed at aggregate demand, can only affect aggregate demand. And so we can only solve one of the two problems of stagflation at, the, at any one time. We can either deal with the inflation part or the stagnating economy or output part. If the government tries to shift aggregate demand, it will either manage to decrease inflation at the expense of decreasing output, or it can increase output at the expense of higher inflation. Either way, the government loses. Visually, it looks something like this. If we're at long-run equilibrium to start, and there's a negative short-run uh, aggregate supply shock, then we go from a point of equilibrium at E1 now to a point of equilibrium at E2. So then government comes along and says, okay, well, let's try and do some fiscal policy to fix this problem. Well, one option is they could try and address the, uh, the issue of rising prices, and they could do that by causing aggregate demand to shift to the left. If they were to do that, pursue a, a contractionary fiscal policy, they would, in fact, succeed in lowering prices from P1 to P0. But they would further exacerbate the problem of redu reduced output, going from Y1 to Y2. So they would further the recession at the expense of killing inflation. So then the government may say, well, that's no good. Um, let's go ahead and increase aggregate demand through expansionary policy to deal with the output problem. And they could do that. But by doing so, they would improve the output going from Y1 back to potential, but the, at the expense of raising prices from P1 to P3. So no matter what the government does, there is a negative consequence to their decision, which is why um, fiscal policy has its limitations. It can only address output gaps created by shifts in aggregate demand.
Why does the government not act more often? Because they don't solve every problem the economy faces. Well, one reason why they don't try and fix every little problem all the time is simply because the government faces significant lags in terms of information. They don't even know that we're in a recession until we're already there. Um, and they don't know that we're out of a recession until we're already there. Um, it takes a long time for them to make a decision. Congress is, uh, has a tendency towards dysfunction and, uh, and disagreement. And so it can take a long time before they agree on a, a singular policy to address an economic issue and it takes a long time to implement. They can pass whatever law they want, but it does take time to ramp up programs and make sure that they get funded and that they get people hired and that the program is rolled out appropriately. So by the time the policies actually get to working, uh, many times the economy has already solved its own problem. So the government's not gonna always step in and act at every little tiny twitch to the right or to the left, um, but instead we'll, we'll oftentimes let the economy try and sort it out. When things get really nasty, that's when the government typically steps in. Now, not every policy is created equal as far as fiscal policies go. It turns out that government spending has a bigger uh, impact on the economy than um, transfers and tax policy do. Essentially, the multiplier is smaller for those than it is for government spending. Remembering that the government multiplier is the same as consumption multiplier. It's 1 over 1 minus MPC. Um, the reason why transfers and tax pay, po payments um, tax policy doesn't have as big a multiplier is in part because consumers don't spend everything that they receive when they receive a tax cut or when they receive a transfer from the government. Um, it, in turn, it turns out that uh, people will save some of the money that they receive and not spend all of it, and so the multiplier is not as big. Uh, we could look at an example where if we assume that there's a, a multiplier of, of two, then if uh, the government increases the government spending by $50 billion, then they put $50 billion in the economy. And uh, But if they do $50 billion in transfers, then uh, people will receive $50 billion, but they're going to keep half of it in savings and spend the other half. Because that's what you do, right? When you receive money, you can either spend or save. So if people are going to save some, then um, not all of the transfer is going to get spent. So then in the second round, we would see with the multiplier, you know, that the, the people would, who received the $50 billion that the government spent would save half of it and spend the other half. And the, the transfers, they spent $25 billion out of the 50, so they're going to spend it on somebody, uh, on, on goods and services. The people they gave their money to will keep half and spend the other half. And if we went through this over and over and over again, we would see that the government multiplier is would lead to a hundred billion dollars in new spending but the transfer policy would only lead to 50 billion and so we find that government spending has a bigger bang for its buck than transfers or tax payments do in fact the tax multiplier is um, much less than one over one minus mpc if we worked through an example and we went to excruciating detail we would find uh, at the end of the day that the tax multiplier is equal to MPC divided by one over one bleh, MPC divided by one minus MPC, which is a smaller number than the tax the government multiplier is. So taxes do multiply either positively or negatively depending on whether you're increasing or decreasing taxes, but they don't have the same effect um, as government spending would have. We're going to talk more about this stuff. We got problem sets to work through, and I'll answer your questions the next time I see you in class.